For the past few weeks, we've been in a series called Blinded by the Blight. And in this series, we've been looking at sins that Christ followers, Christians, can too often tolerate, make room for in their lives. And the reason is, is because these sins, at least in our minds, in comparison to other kinds of sins, don't seem like that big of a deal seem relatively harmless, again, in comparison to these other sins. The reality is, though, any sin, every sin, is a big deal, including the ones that we tolerate. In fact, those particular sins can often cause more damage in our lives, in our walk with Christ, and in our witness for Christ, precisely because we don't take them seriously. Seriously. We don't pay them any mind. We don't try to resist them and overcome them with the Spirit's help and the help of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. But these sins that we tolerate, they do all kinds of damage. They keep you from seeing and experiencing Christ more clearly in your life, and they keep others from experiencing and from clearly seeing Christ in your life. So a few weeks ago, we looked at apathy, We've looked at ingratitude. Last week, we looked at divisiveness, any spirit, attitude, or behavior that undermines the, the unity of the church. Well, today, we're going to look at a sin that, at first glance, might surprise you that it's on the list. Because when you think about this particular sin that we're going to look at, at it today, you, you tend, or maybe I do anyway, we tend to think of it in terms of its worst expressions. And with those expressions in mind, you might think, well, there is no way that a Christian would ever tolerate that particular sin. And I'm talking about the sin of worldliness. Worldliness. See, when I think of worldliness, and maybe you think along with me, I, I think of those behaviors, those attitudes that people engage in who have no fear of God. We think of deeds like sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now, those all sound very worldly. It's worldly people who engage in those kinds of things. And those behaviors are so outrageous, if a Christian saw that in his life or in her life, surely they would not tolerate it. They wouldn't make room for it, and they shouldn't. And let me say, those types of sins, they can be expressions of worldliness. But they're not what we're going to focus on today when we look at worldliness. Now, what we're going to look at can certainly lead to some of those expressions, but not always and maybe not even usually. And that's why worldliness, at least in the way we're going to look at it, the aspect that we're going to look at, can be so easily tolerated in the lives of Christ followers. See, the worldliness that we're going to look at is more of a condition of the heart before it's a condition of the flesh. And this type of worldliness... It's been around for a long, long time. It's afflicted God's people for a long, long time. We see it in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. In Genesis 19, God is about to pour out his wrath against the horrific wickedness of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. However, one family in one of those cities is given the opportunity to flee from that city. It's the family of a man named Lot. They had been God followers. They had settled in the city of Sodom. And an angel appears to them and tells them what is about to happen. He tells them to flee, to run. And finally, they heed the warning and they make their way out of the city. Lot his wife, and two daughters. And they are told to run. They are told not to look back. One of the angels ordered, run for, your, run for your lives. 
and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains or you will be swept away. Those sound like very clear instructions to me. Run. Don't look back. Run. Don't look back. But apparently those instructions were a little too much for everybody to follow. Because as we read, Lot's wife looked back as she was following Lot. And she turned into a pillar of salt. Why did she look back? What was it about Sodom that had a hold on her? The text doesn't spell it out. All we can do is speculate. But based upon the context, based upon the punishment she receives, she was looking back because her heart was more with Sodom than it was with the one who was giving her deliverance from Sodom and all of its brokenness. Now, was it the moral depravity of Sodom that had a hold on Lot's wife? Did she miss out on the good times that the people of Sodom were having as they engaged in all kinds of debauchery? Again, we don't know, but I wonder. Because I'm not sure that's what had a hold on Lot's wife. I wonder if the hold that Sodom had on Lot's wife had more to do with its familiarity. You see, she knows how things work in Sodom. She doesn't know how things work where she's going. Maybe it was the way the society was set up in Sodom. In Sodom, she was married to a prominent man. That gave her status. She doesn't know if she's going to have high status to where she's headed. In Sodom, there are resources, resources that she could take advantage of that would numb her to the pains of this life, the problems, the worries, the anxieties. Will where she's going have those kinds of resources available to her? There was a certainty with Sodom that she doesn't have with where she's going. And it's that kind of worldliness that we as Christians can too often tolerate today. The blight of worldliness blinds you to what you can't see in favor of what you can see. It blinds you to what you can't see in favor of what you can see. And that blight, that kind of worldliness is the exact opposite of faith. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You see, for the Christ follower, our confidence is not in what we can see in the here and now, in the ways of the world, in what the world has to offer. No, our confidence, our hope is in what we can't see now. It's in what Christ accomplished for us through his death on the cross and in his victory over the grave. Everything we need, everything we depend on, everything we hope for is secured for us in the cross and in his victory over the grave. And so as the Apostle Paul writes, as for me, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, because of that cross alone, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. But sometimes and often without noticing it, the blight of worldliness creeps into our lives and dulls our vision to what Christ has accomplished and we shift our gaze from the cross back to the world and to what it offers 
to give us hope, to give us relief from our sorrows, to give us worth. For example, instead of continuing to trust in what Christ has done to redeem us, to save us, to make us friends with God, the world offers us self-justification. You know, some people have a hard time accepting God's grace no matter how desperate their need for God's grace is. And why is that? Because that is not how things work in this world. In this world, you pay your own debts. If you grew up in the 1970s watching TV, you learned this slogan, if you can't do the time, don't do the what? Don't do the crime. A lot of you 50-plus-year-olds know exactly what I'm talking about. Self-justification is the way of the world. And as far as how things work in this world, there is some merit to it. I mean, there are consequences to your actions, and those consequences can often steer us from continuing to make foolish choices. And there is something to be said for paying off your own loans, paying off your own car loan, paying off your own housing loan, paying off your own student loans. If you took out the money, then you should pay it back. But there is a debt that all of us have incurred that none of us can pay back, no matter how much effort we put into it. A debt so steep that if we were to try and pay it off, it would take us all of eternity and then some. And that is the debt incurred in our lives by our own sin, by our own rebellion against God. Our sin buries us under a mountain of debt before the holy God. The wages of sin, what we deserve for our sin is death. Eternal estrangement from God, the Bible tells us. Our sin, your sin, even the slightest sin infects your life with a black mold that the holiness of God will not tolerate but will only destroy. It is like paper meeting fire. When our sin meets God's holiness, comes up against God's holiness, it is consumed as paper is consumed by fire. That's what we deserve. That's what we have incurred. However, in his love, God spares us the wrath of his holiness against our sin by doing what? By taking that wrath upon himself, which he does through the death of his son Jesus upon the cross. On the cross, Jesus experiences our wrath in our place. It's not we who are consumed. It is Jesus who is consumed. And by trusting in what he has done for us, rather than trusting in what we can do to save ourselves, that's when we are set free. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus. That's it. In faith, you depend upon what Jesus has done to save you. You do not depend. You let go of anything that you think you can do to save you. He's paid the debt all of it. There's nothing more you need to add to it. There's nothing you can add to what he has already accomplished. But that's too easy, isn't it? Salvation, eternal salvation, should not be so simple. It should be hard. It should be complicated. That's how things work in this world. It reminds me of something a comedian once said. He said this, there, there's a product on TV that was available for four easy payments of 1995. He said, I would like a product that's available for three easy payments and one hard payment. We can't tell you which payment it is, but one of these payments is going to be complicated. The mailman will get shot. The envelope will not seal. The stamp will be in the wrong denomination. The final payment must be made in wampum beads. <laughs> That's what we want to do with salvation. We want to make it hard. We want to make it complicated. We want to take what is so simple, just receive in faith, and add 
stuff to it. That's worldliness as it's applied to God's gift of grace. Because in this world, we respect the self-made person. We loathe the person who is incapable of taking care of themselves. There's no pride in that. And so even as Christ followers, we can fall prey to the blight of self-justification, thinking our good deeds, our church service, our church attendance, our prayers, all of that and so much more, we can add to what Jesus has done. But it doesn't. And when you start patting yourself on the back for all that you're doing to make your salvation in Jesus Christ even more secure, you know what you're doing with that hand? As you're patting yourself on the back, you're letting go of Jesus. Because you can't hold on to Jesus and pat yourself on the back at the same time. It's one way or the other. And so to break free of that temptation that the world offers of self-justification, we've got to keep replacing our pride with humility. And you know who can help us with that? Besides the Word of God, besides the Holy Spirit, our church family, our brothers and sisters in Christ. How? Well, through relationships where we can, can confess our sins to one another. Confession does so many things, but one thing it does for sure is to keep us humble. It reminds us that we never have it so together that we can stop depending upon what Jesus has done for us. The church also helps us through relationships where we can encourage one another. For some, we need to be encouraged by reminders that there's nothing that we've done, there's nothing in our past that is beyond the reach of the cross of Christ. For others, we need to be re reminded, we need to be encouraged that even in our ongoing struggles with sin and temptation, God's not giving up on us. God's not rejecting us. For others, we need to be encouraged by reminders that God truly delights in us, not because we have it so together, but because in Christ, through faith in Him, we've been made children of God. And as every good parent delights in their children, whether they're cleaned up for Sunday morning or whether they're a mess from playing in the mud, God delights in us. The world says, justify yourself before God. It's a lie. We don't need assistance. We need rescuing. And that's what the cross achieves. It achieves our rescue. The more you appreciate the desperation of your situation before God brought on by your sin, the more beautiful the cross and the more beautiful the cross and what God has achieved for you through the cross, the more repulsive you're going to find any attempt at self-justification. Something else that the world offers that we're tempted to turn to away from Christ is what it offers to give us that will provide relief for us during those hard seasons of our lives. And I'll sum it up in one word, escapism. The world offers us so many forms of escapism. A few moments ago, we looked at Galatians 5, 19 through 21. We looked at a list of behaviors that often mark lives lived in slavery to the flesh, behaviors like sexual immorality, debauchery, witchcraft, hatred, fits of rage, selfish ambition, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like, all of that. I, I think when we think of people who engage in those kinds of activities, we think of people who just think that happiness is found in indulging every lust of the flesh. Those people who do those kinds of things, they think that's where the good life is. That's where the fun is 
in life. And I'm sure that's the motivation for some. They think, they really believe that the good life is found in pursuing all of these lusts of the flesh and lusts of the eyes. Okay, we see that in the book of Ecclesiastes, for example. But I wonder, I wonder if that's not the case for everybody. I wonder if for others, if indulging in those behaviors has less to do with seeking, with seeking pleasure and more to do with coping. Coping with the challenges, with the stresses, with the hurts, with the anxieties of life. For some, substance abuse or alcohol abuse or pornography or sexual immorality or materialism, all of that and so much more, it's not really about pleasure. It's about escaping. It's about numbing. It's about coping. And sometimes in this life, even for the Christ follower, those escapes from the hardships of this life, they're so tempting to grab onto because of the momentary relief they provide. But when we do, when we reach for the world's ways of coping, what are we doing when we're reaching? We're letting go. We're letting go of God. You see, it's the world's way to curse God and die when life hurts. Curse God and die. But for those who hope in Christ, in those moments or in those seasons of pain, of distress, of hurt, of anxiety, of depression, of hardship, we are to tighten our grip on God even more. Though he may slay me, yet will I hope in him. Those are the words of Job. Arguably, one of the people who suffered the most in this life. Oh, how easy it would have been to numb his pain through one of the many ways of the world or to follow the words of his wife, curse God and die. And yet, though he may slay me, yet will I hope in him. He doesn't escape. He doesn't numb. Instead, he continues to trust, even in the hurt. How do we do that? How do we do that? We hang on, we endure, we persevere through, and there are many ways, but I'm just going to look at some of the examples given to us in the fourth chapter of Philippians. We do it through prayer. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. And in your prayers, it doesn't say this, but we know from the book of Psalms, you can lay it all out before God. You can cry out to God. Share with Him your frustrations and such. Paul says, tell God what you need. Thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live, as you persevere, as you continue to trust in Christ Jesus. Will, will that work? Is it true? We sometimes will wonder. But we continue to lean into his promises, trusting in his faithfulness. Another way we, we hang on, we endure, is through the constant renewing of our minds, reframing how we think about those things that feed our fears, fuel, fuel our anxieties, and increase our shame. No, we, we counter those thoughts by fixing our thoughts on what is true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable, we think about those things that are excellent and praiseworthy. What might some of those things be? Freedom we have in Christ. Total acceptance by God through faith in Christ. 
that our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west and so many more, then the God of peace will be with you. Will that work? We wonder sometimes, but we continue to lean into his promises, trusting in his faithfulness. How else do we endure? How else do we hang in there? Another way is by leaning on one another in the church to endure as Paul did in times of hardship. He's suffering as he writes that letter to the Philippians. And yet he says, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And then he goes on to say this, even so you have done well to share with me in my present sufferings. One of the reasons he endured, he hung in there, is because he had the support of the church. Will that work? Will the support of the church help me in those times? Will it give me peace? Will it help me to be content? We wonder sometimes, but we continue to lean into God's promises, trusting in his faithfulness, and so we share our struggles with one another. We pray for one another. We allow others to pray for us. We check in on one another. We allow them to check in on us. We take advantage of those resources that might offer deeper help to counter those escape mechanisms that can enslave us. So we take advantage, as, take advantage of resources like faith-based counseling or Celebrate Recovery or Financial Peace University. And in those seasons where it feels like the gray clouds will never lift, we choose to continue trusting anyway. As the psalmist writes in his own season of suffering, I wait. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. That's a conscientious decision that has to be made sometimes, not just every day, but moment by moment. As one person writes, for those who continue waiting on God, God does provide grace for today. He writes, on some days that grace will feel like strength for a battle. Other days it might feel like spiritual rest. And other days... It might feel like mere survival. Another aspect of worldliness that can become a blight in the lives of Christ followers is the world's promise of self-worth, of giving yourself worth. And of all the ways that can draw our attention away from the cross, I think this is one of the most sad ways. And here's why. Think about it. In the cross... In the cross, we have the creator of the universe telling us, I love you. And I want to spend eternity with you so much that I will do anything in my power to make that happen. Even when we were God's enemies, he made peace with us because his son died for us Yet something even greater than friendship is ours. Now that we are at peace with God, we will be saved by the life of his son. And in addition to everything else, we are happy because God sent our Lord Jesus Christ to make peace with us. Except sometimes, sometimes, it's not enough. Some of us are not happy. We're not content with God's approval, with God's friendship, with God's love. It's not enough. And so we look back to the world and we think, how, how much greater my worth would be if, if this group or if that group or if this individual or that individual liked me, wanted me, desired me or if I could only achieve this or gain this much or build it this much how much more worth would I have and, and so instead of resting in the peace of our friendship 
with God earned through the death of Jesus Christ, we instead try to find our worth in what others think of us and how many likes we can get and how much we can build up in our bank account and what we can achieve or even in the good deeds we can accomplish or in the service that we can perform in the life of the church. Maybe that will give me worth. The problem with seeking self-worth in all of those things is that you will never have enough likes. You will never have enough in your bank account. You will never achieve enough to make you feel like you have worth. It's the cross that sets you free from all of that. In the cross, God says, you belong to me. I delight in you. And if we allow ourselves to fully believe that, it's enough. And we stop chasing. And we rest in our peace. Again, where can we hear those reminders of where our worth is really found in what God sees in us and what God has done for us? We find it in God's word, but we also find it in fellowship with other Christians who can remind us, who can encourage us. We need each other. Again, it's not just non-Christians who seek to find worth in what they can achieve or in the approval of others. So many of us fall prey to that same temptation. It's as if God's approval is not enough. But if God's approval of you, God's acceptance of you, God's friendship with you is not enough for you to find worth, nothing will. Nothing will. You know, Jesus knows there will be times when we are tempted to give up on him and to shift our focus into what the world has to offer and what the world has to offer in terms of justifying ourselves and relieving us of our pains and sorrows or giving us relief from those pains and sorrows or in what the world offers to find our worth to counter those temptations when they come, and they will come, Jesus gives a three-worded warning. Luke 17, remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Don't let worldliness blind you to what you can't see in favor of what you can see, because what you can see now will not endure. It's what you can't see now that ultimately endures. Jesus tells us to expect troubles and hardships in this life, but he also promises that we will overcome if we are faithful to continue trusting in him. And so the question for each of us is, will you be faithful? Will you continue to hold on to, to grip, to trust in, what you can't see right now. When many turned away from Jesus because they trusted more in what they could see rather than in what they couldn't see, Jesus asks his closest followers if they too are going to abandon him. Peter answers for all who are resolved to trust more in what they can't see than in what they can see when he answers, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and we know that you are the Holy One of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray with the help of your Holy Spirit and with the help of our brothers and sisters in Christ, each of us, would have that same resolve to continue trusting, holding fast to our faith in you despite the temptation to want to 
somehow earn at least a little bit of our salvation or to escape through what the world offers to numb us to our pain and challenges rather than waiting on you depending upon what you provide to endure or to pursue that temptation to find our worth in something other than who we are in your eyes. Lord, your word tells us that better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. But sometimes the world counters that with offering us thousands of temptations. Lord, may we hold fast to the beauty of your kingdom and our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen.